You've been charged for staying dedicated to the grind. You have the right to remain silent and keep the hustle to yourself or help others with Station the Station name for the record? DJ VIP. How you come up with that name? I was given uh, that name by a friend from uh, my uh, church league basketball team when I was in the eighth grade. So you're on a basketball team and they just call you VIP, man? DJ VIP? She just called me a VIP. VIP. And we ran with it. So you ask you what position you play? Man, I was like a, I was a power forward most of the time. I didn't really have the height at the time and, and the, the body to be a center, but I wasn't quick enough and I just didn't have the handles to get down as, you know, a point or a shooting guard like that. I wasn't a shooter. So where's your hometown from, man? Where are you from? Union City. Union City. Where is that at? Uh, it's the East Bay, Bay Area, California. Bay Area, East yeah. Bay. Only thing East Bay I know is about the little shoes we buy off the East Bay magazine. Oh no, that, <laughs> that magazine is actually based out of the East Coast. Mm. So the Bay Area, I mean, so how's the culture out there? What what's going on out there in your high school years? That's where you went to high school. Yeah, when I was in the Bay, um, two thousand five, two thousand six, uh, there was the the hypey movement was very prevalent. So you know, E forty, Keek the Sneak, um, R. I. P. Mac Dre. Uh, you know, Bavgate and the Federation, YB, uh, your boy, Rich Rocker now. Uh, just the Bay was on fire in 2005, 2006. So I grew up around uh, a lot of culture and when there was a, a big movement going on around me. So it was uh, easy to get involved with stuff and easy to really to fall in love with music at that time. So, so then that's where you decided to get into music? How you fall into being a DJ? Man, DJing was was something that it kind of like got brought to me. My homie had brought me a magazine that had some DJ equipment in it. And I was like, man, that shit looks dope. Like, that's cool. So I just kind of started looking into it, doing some research. And then I called a local radio station and they uh, they linked me with some gear. I'm like, yo, I need some equipment. Y'all got something in the back room I could take or something? Like, get me started. I was hungry. and. Uh, this personality by the name of Fresca had laced me up with some gear, and that's what really got me started uh, with my DJing when I was in the eighth grade. So you never tried being an artist? No, I never tried rapping. You will not find nothing of me online rapping. It <laughs> doesn't exist, so never tried to be an artist. So when you came into, man, who created that DJ VIP logo, man? Pretty sick. Man, I forgot bro's name, to be honest, but I'm the one who came up with the concept uh, his name is Ulysses. That's what his name was. Um, I came up with a concept of wanting to utilize a record. And my D, you could tell, it looks like a record in the O part. It's got the little vinyl grooves in it. And my J curves around like a needle. So that was something I wanted to implement in my logo. And uh, that was definitely my idea, but Ulysses brought it to fruition. So who introduced you, man, in the snowboarding? Man, well, my exes did, you know? Uh, one of my ex from college laced me up with the snowboarding. And as a kid, I grew up in the mountains. I went camping. I was very active, went fishing, spent a lot of time with my parents, my grandparents. And uh, I love the outdoors, but I was never introduced to snowboarding because my parents, my mom in particular, was a worry ward. Yeah. So, you know, bless her heart. But she, uh, she was just always scared I was going to get hurt. And most of the time I did. But uh, when I was old enough to financially do it myself on my own time in college. I took it up and I've just been running with it since. Yeah, I tried snowboarding one time, man. Got to the top of the hill and realized that snow is hard as hell. It walked all the way back there. <laughs> yeah, if, if it's icy, it's not fun. You gotta make sure you're in fresh powder, otherwise it, it won't be a good time. Yeah, they didn't tell me nothing about no fresh powder, man. So who um, what, who in the music industry are you affiliated with? Like what group are you in? Well, I work directly with Nipsey Hussle, um, All Money In, All Money Out. Uh, I've been with him since 2012 or so. Uh, I've had a relationship with him since 2009, 2010. I was booking him for a lot of shows, uh, in particular like club hostings. So yeah. I would DJ a lot of clubs in Hollywood. And I got put on to his music when I was a partner at some of these events. I suggested that he got brought on. And he was nowhere near as big as he is now. So we got him for a very fair and reasonable price. Um, got a lot of promo out of it and in turn built a relationship with Nip that is what it is today. So I will take you a part of the All Money Inn team. Yes. Now say um, somebody else want to hire you as a DJ. 
could you be on like two different teams? I mean, you could, but that's not me. You know, I'm, I'm, there's a lot of DJs that, and there's, you know, no shade to them, but they jump around with artists and a lot of it is just opportunity, you know, and they're, they're, they need that opportunity. So they have to, you know, kind of disabandon loyalty. Cause in my opinion, if you're really going to be an artist's DJ, you need to be full time with them. You need to be available to them at all times. Cause if you're a really cracking artist or that's what you aspire to be, you're going to need that at some point. So we had to lock in really early to me being around and being available, which, you know, sometimes it, it's a little bit of a drawback, but for the most part, they're real respectful of my schedule, letting me know about stuff ahead of time. I'm never finding out about stuff last yeah. minute unless it literally happens last minute. So I choose not to want to work with other artists just to give everything I can to that situation. 100%. Yeah, because if I'm, you know, dibble dabbling, then I won't be there for long. And I see a lot of opportunity with Nipsey. And I see, I had seen his dream and, believed in what he was preaching very early on. And to this day, everything he's talked about has, has came to fruition. So I fully believe in him and his message and the path that we're on. So a dedication, man. So um, so being a DJ, you basically got to believe in the artist that really to stick that time in. I mean, yeah, I would think so. Because if, if you don't believe in that artist and, and there's not a lot of gigs coming through, you're not busy, then you're just going to go do what's next to so go get your bread. Now, Luckily, how do the DJ get paid? Uh, how do they get paid? Yeah, like, do they get a percentage of the venue uh, thing or how? I mean, it, it just depends, like, with any business. It depends on the business you set up okay. and the agreements you set up. So um, who connected you to Nipsey Hussle? How you come across? Man, my good friend from, from high school, his name's SP Beats. He's uh, out of Fullerton. And um, he told me, he's like, you need to go check out this artist named Nipsey Hussle. I'm like, who's Nipsey? Like, I never heard of him. I'm in LA. I've been in LA at this point for like two or three years. I thought I was tapped into the culture. I'm like, who's Nipsey? Like, I don't know who this dude is. So I look him up. Okay, he's a rapper, Slauson, you know, Crenshaw and Slauson. He's from that side, West Side, LA. And I'm just like, all right, I'm not really tapped into the streets like that. Like, I was getting the the understanding of the difference in commercial music from the Bay Area yeah. to LA, but I wasn't fully tapped into like the way the Bay had their movement going on. I wasn't tapped into like the localized movements oh, yet. Girl. So he put me up on his music. I'm like, okay, this is cool. But I kind of didn't really give it a, a, a fair listen. So maybe a few months later, I got booked on this event at the Dragonfly in Hollywood. And it was a Nipsey Hustle show. So I was DJ and I was the house DJ, a few opening acts and Nipsey was hosting. So I'm like, or, or performing, I'm thinking, man, I remember this name, but I don't remember his music. So then, after the show, I go back and I tap into the project, to the marathon. And that's where I'm like, oh, yeah, this dude's on to something. So that's when I started to really become a fan first of Nipsey's music. That was in, like, 2009. So, so like, say back, cause I know early music with Nipsey was really cripping. Mm -hmm. um, so was that kind of intimidating from coming from the Bay Area, coming to the gangland of L.A., dealing with an artist straight in the culture of the gang? It was different, but it wasn't something that that I was necessarily like scared of, or it was just something that was new that I was, I wanted to learn about. Cause I didn't really understand LA gang culture and how the streets are and the colors from the Bay where I'm from is more so turfs. It's not really bloods and crips and like it's, this is my block. And you might have some, some Mexicans and blacks that are living together or they got a turf and it's not, it doesn't have to do with necessarily your race or your colors. Just y'all all live on that same block. That's your neighborhood. That's what you protect. So what made you drop this wrap up mix in 2014, man? I had seen a lack of a presence of physical copies. One thing that I noticed when hip hop and when DJs were really booming was the mixtape game was going crazy. And, you know, drama definitely set like a big bar for that. And obviously he had to deal with the repercussions for it. Um, but my, my mixtape, the, uh, the wrap up mix is a promotional mixtape that I do every year for, for, for the fans. You know, it's, it doesn't really, for me, I wanted to build a catalog of something that later down the line, whether I'm around or not, it's just something that I've done. Like I got these hard copies and they're, they're always going to be here, obviously exist digitally, but I wanted to create this catalog that showed consistency. And every year I put out the project that ranges from like 32 to 40 songs. 
and they're all mixed together. So it plays like one long track. It sounds like you're at the club, but you don't got to deal with the DJ yelling over the mic the whole time. You can put the thing on and let it ride for your party. Yeah. Top songs from the year, R&B, rap, and hip hop. And, you know, the top charting songs, top songs in the club, in my opinion. And from all these years, now five years in, I get a great response. I got people in June, July telling me they're still listening to last year's wrap up mix. I got people who tell me I got the the 14 in the car, the 15 in the car, you know. I so I got the 14, 15 on my phone right now, man. There you yeah. go. <laughs> so so it, it's doing so good right now. So I know you got artists trying to pay you to be on it. Do you accept it or Yeah, no, that that's merely a commercial mixtape. So I've gotten some some decent offers for some money, but that's not what it's about for me. It's about creating a consistent catalog and a themed project. As you could see every year, it's got a very similar theme. We just swap up the colors and I usually do a play on the colors depending on um, just what stands out to me that year. So one year is it was like, I think, where's colors? I think that was the year that they won out from the Bay. So yeah. that was like homage to them. Um, this past year I did red, white and black. That was kind of a play on victory lap because of what happened in 2018 with Victory Lap and all the success we had seen with that. So every year I try to have that that continuity with the project theme, but always come with different style of songs, obviously, and mixing and try to just raise the bar every year. Now, so with your project, with the CDs, now did your team also like bring in, like say if I order a, a Crenshaw shirt, would they throw your CD in the package too? Have yeah, you work a deal out with that? I mean, I've given CDs to the shop, but Everything with the marathon clothing is totally separate from what I do. It's a part and obviously within the the all money in brand yeah. and capsule and we try to do as much stuff as we can together, but the CDs haven't been directly like packaged in with anything with the marathon clothing. To be honest, I spend a lot more time on the music side of stuff than apparel. Okay. So let's get back to um what was one of your favorite venues you perform at? Man, we've done a lot of big venues. I would say Oracle Arena was big. That was like two years ago. We did an event with, I want to say, Rock Nation and BET. It was a Andre Ward fight. That was a televised event. That was big for me because that the venue Oracle Arena was the first place that I ever went to my first NBA basketball game. So it was almost surreal to you know, be at some place that, as a kid, I'm over here watching these professionals and, you know, whether they're performing basketball or performing music, they're getting paid to do what they love on this big scale. So now I'm in the same arena in my hometown. That meant a lot to me. Uh, obviously, the um, different dates on the tour, just because significant people that were in the building or the venues or, you know, some of the, the what really well-known venues, I've got the name of the place in San Francisco, but my grandpa knew who it was. He's like, oh, the greats have performed there. And you go in there, you just see everyone's name who's performed in the green room. And it's, it just makes you appreciate the moment. And for me, it inspires me to know that I came from just this little kid from a suburban town in Union City, you know, went to yeah. a 5,000 person high school. I wasn't any like exceptionally standout a scholar or athlete, but I maintained enough to get a scholarship and get me in LA, which is where all this started to fester and come to life. So I just appreciate all of it. And it reminds me that really anything's possible as long as you stay active and, and uh, consistent with your grind. And I, I feel like a big part of that too is loyalty. Yeah. You say loyal to the brand and the, the team, and they do blow up, you know what I'm saying? People won't replace you. Mm -hmm. It's 100%. You, know, you can't be doing no funny shit when, when, good moments come, you know, you can't be acting funny when, when the tough times come, you just gotta keep it consistent. So um, what was one of your biggest challenges as a DJ? I would, to this day, it's, uh, I grew up very, I wouldn't say quiet, a little bit more reserved. I wasn't always the most outspoken person. So for me, just like talking in front of people was, was like a fear of mine. When I would be in college, you know, 2007, 2008, and do group projects or whatever, I would be nervous talking in front of a small group of like 20, 30, 40 people. Yeah. So that was something I had to overcome was like stage fright, just being in front of so many people, so many eyes on me. But once I really knew that like people were there because they want to see us and, you know, I mean, they're not there to hate on us, they're not there to be on no funny shit. They love what we do. Just do it. 
So I show up and get cool. past all that. So do you ever feel like the DJ get overshadowed? I think in some instances, but it's not about people don't go for the artist slash DJ experience unless that's what it's sold as, you know? Uh, I think who who was it? Maybe Who Kid and like Waka Flocka or somebody, they went on a little run together and they had a full set they did. But when people are going to these shows, they're going to see Nipsey perform. Luckily, he gives me an opening set to where before he even comes out, I get to do my thing. So I've definitely been given the blessing of having a spotlight on me as well as him going above and beyond and you know featuring me on his socials because he don't really have to do that you go yeah. look at a lot of artists and you see that they might have their dj in the background but their dj might get a, a very won't get a tag won't get uh won't even be in like a recap video they'll kind of almost go out their way to keep the dj out of it so it's just about the artist but nipsey has given me that platform and allowed his video team to incorporate me in those videos we just did a release of the recap from the Warner Music Party. And aside from Nipsey, I'm the only other person that has an actual close up in that recap video. And, you know, that doesn't mean a lot to most people, but to me it does, because I know a lot of other DJs don't get that light. And I can see what it does for me firsthand with new work that it brings in and the, uh, the amount of respect that it commands and how much it's allowed me to level up myself. So, sometime down in your career, do you plan on being a festival DJ? That's something that I like to do. It's not something that you just like say, okay, I want to become a festival DJ. A lot of that has to do with having a solid following. There needs to be um, either a lot of original content or you need to be making a lot of remixes. In my case, right now I have a lot of remixes, but this year I'm going to be working on original content as well. So um, a lot of those EDM DJs that you see at the festivals, a a high percentage of their content that they're doing, they're not just spinning other people's records. And that's what a lot of the hip hop DJing is based around, unless you take it to like an executive producer level, like Khaled, drama, where you start uh, mustard, you start coming up with your own content. So that's what I wanna do, and that's something I'm focused on this year so that I can start touching festival stages, is doing more original content. Original content. Mm -hmm. So I noticed not a brand yourself, man. So who taught you the branding game? Nobody's formally taught me. I went to school for radio and television. So, I mean, there's little, you know, book game you get from that, like the, the educational side of it, but you don't really get the practical street side or like how to, how to use it. So me, I more so had just learned on my own. It was trial and error uh, and watching people studying the game and seeing what people are doing that is successful and seeing where people might be missing the mark and how I could capitalize on it. So what's your ultimate goal in this whole DJ world, man? I, I want to live a life around music. I want to create music. I want to do shows. Um, when it comes down to it, I really just don't want to work. You know, I want to get paid to do something I love and I love DJing. So whether it be doing shows or working with artists in the studio or, you know, venturing back to what I got my degree in and doing something with radio. As long as I'm around music, I think I'll be pretty happy. But what you just described seemed like a whole lot of traveling. Now, do you have a spouse, kids in, in your life? Or what's going on with that, man? No, I don't have a spouse. I have two dogs that are, that are definitely like kids, but I got a cool program worked out to where whether, if I need to leave at a drop of a dime, like if I got a call right now, I got bags in the car, I'm ready to leave. My dogs is straight. I got dog feeders. I got my security system. I got dog doors. So the the little bit of, with, I mean, not little, but the, the things that I do have to take care of, like those, you know, family type things and the stuff that comes first, I got it covered to the T. And it's just from trial and error. There's been times where I got a call and I wasn't on deck with a, a bag. You know, I wasn't ready to leave and they needed me right now. So I had to fly out and just go with nothing. My dog wasn't ready. I only had one dog at the time. Now I got two dogs and my program's down tight. So when I do leave and when I want to get up and travel, I don't have nothing holding me up. So let's say you're on this tour living your life, DJing around the world. Um, you smash a groupie, you become <laughs> pregnant. Do you, you alter your life and become a, a parent or fuck, you going to stay on that career path? I mean, I'm going to do what I need to do as a man to take care of anything that that I might bring to life, you know, literally or, or uh, whatever. But I'm uh, I'm on this this path, you know. I, I I've already 
missed other opportunities or not even opportunities, but I've turned down other situations to do what I'm doing now. So I think it'd be a disservice and disrespectful to myself to stop it for any other reason other than a reason that I want to stop it. So do you smoke weed, man? I do. It's legal in California. How about on the job? Um, if, if everything's taken care of and I can relax a little bit, then yeah. Now, is you a heavy smoker or you smoke a blunt a day or something? What's the average? Man, me and my boys having this conversation yesterday. I think I'm a heavy smoker. About five to maybe ten blunts a day. Shit, so you wake up smoking. A hundred percent. So that don't get you out your motivation of want to get out here and grind? Nah, not at all. Have you ever fucked up on the job? Not on account of smoking. I would say, I mean, there's been little things that we've had issues with, but they're they're not so much um, something that I did, more so just like technical failures. So you are old school smoker with blunts, and what about this wax? You fuck with that wax and all that? I can't do that. See, that's where I get unfunctional. You know, that's where the unmotivated smoker is, is with the wax. To me, I can't do it. I smoke blunts. Yeah, because rumor, man, I heard rumor that you don't go nowhere without a blunt. Even when you're driving. I I need my lawyer, bro. I I, I ain't answering that one. I plead the fifth. All right, man. Your, your choice, man. I'm going to go get them right now. Grind face.